Good evening, everyone. My name is Callie coffin Friels. My pronouns are she, her, and I am excited to be with you this evening to discuss how to become a stronger writer. Um, as we're letting folks come in, I just want to share how excited I am to be with you here tonight. Um, I'm a premium tutor here at Apple Ruth, and I tutor a couple of different things, but helping students grow as writers is probably my favorite thing that I work with students on. Um, so I'm very excited to be able to share something that I'm pretty passionate about with you this evening. Um, so let me kind of set the stage for where we are going tonight. Um, so we'll start by talking a little bit about Apple Ruth's why, why we do the work that we do here at Apple Ruth. And then we'll talk about a couple of different things related to the importance of writing, how it serves us in everyday life, as well as in an academic setting. We'll talk about how to brainstorm and organize your thoughts before you sit down to actually write the thing that you're going to write. We'll talk about crafting a thesis, how to do some transitions, and we'll also talk about the importance of revision, which tends to be a step that most students don't really enjoy doing. Um, but we'll talk about how to make it a little bit better and really underscore the importance of it. We'll also talk about how to provide feedback um, because that's a huge piece of revision. Um, and I think sometimes when we think about providing feedback to students on their writing, we can kind of envision that as being a mostly negative thing where when students see something about feedback, they interpret that as, oh, you're going to tell me about all the things I messed up. So we just kind of want to um, dissuade any notions about like what feedback looks like um, because you can definitely present feedback uh, that is constructive in a positive way. And then we'll wrap up with some ways to grow as a writer. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of our time this evening. So if you've got some questions, please feel free to hold on to those. Um, and we will open up the floor for questions at the end in our Q&A. But we have a very full hour ahead of us. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. So starting with Apple Ruth's why. Um, so here at Apple Ruth, our motto is building better, burner, better learners for life. And we deeply believe that when you change students' self-beliefs, you can change their lives, right? The, the science, the psychology behind how we view ourselves is fascinating. And students who tend to think highly of themselves are not in like an arrogant way, but in a confident way, in a I can do this kind of way, or I'm capable of learning in this material kind of way, dramatically affects that outlook on their life, the trajectory that they get and how they embrace academics, but not just how they embrace academics, but just how they carry themselves in the world. And so at Apple Ruth, we believe very much in helping students actualize the reality that they are capable, that they can learn these things. So we help students uh, change their self-beliefs in a couple different areas. Uh, first, we help students in the area of academic tutoring. So that involves a wide variety of things, including writing tutoring, which is what we're talking about this evening, growing as writers. Uh, we also support students in um, class support from kindergarten all the way up into college. Um, so we provide support on a wide variety of subjects, just about anything under the sun, frankly, um, at all grade levels. So if you have a student who maybe needs a little bit of support or maybe wants a little bit of extra help this summer while they're getting ready for a challenging class this fall, like absolutely reach out to us, we'd be happy to help. Another sphere where we help students change their self-belief is with test prep. And that absolutely covers college admissions with the ACT and the SAT, but that also covers several other areas, looking at private school admissions, even up into the GRE, when we're looking at graduate level material. And we also help students um, change their self-belief in the realm of executive function coaching. So this discipline is relatively new out and about in the world. Um, it's been around for a couple of years now, and it's basically what Jed Apple Ruth likes to call helping students with the invisible syllabus of school. So the things that come intuitively to some students, but maybe not so intuitively to others, things like organizing your planner, how to create an organizational system so you know where your assignments are. And once you've finished them, you can see that you have in fact turned them in or helping students map out planning for large projects that are going to take several weeks to complete, right? Things like that, that some students just kind of have that internal wiring figured out and they know how to structure their time well, 
Um, for some students, that is not a natural uh, inclination at all. So executive function coaching helps students develop strategies for creating organizational systems that work with how they process information. Um, so those are just some of the areas that uh, we help students change their self-beliefs. And we believe that when students gain mastery experiences in any of these disciplines, it allows them to see that change within themselves. Um, so that's just a little bit about who Apple Ruth is and what we care about. Um, for tonight's content, though, we are going to be squarely in that academic support category, looking at the importance of writing. Okay, so let's start with a brief history of writing in education. Um, so widespread literacy became a necessity in America, particularly around the Industrial Revolution. Right. Part of that had to do with as workplace safety became a larger issue, you start to see folks unionizing and things like that. Um, a literate workforce tends to be a little bit safer. Like you can post notices about the dangers of a certain machine and et cetera. Um, that said, outside of that value of being able to read the notices that your employer posts, at that time, there wasn't an intrinsic benefit to teaching that particular workforce how to write. Education from that point has grown and advanced in many ways. Um, however, writing is sometimes deprioritized in a lot of schools. And I don't say that at all as a knock against our educational system. When we look at the English language portion of teaching at this point, once we get to high school, the emphasis on our English classes really shifts to focus primarily on exposing students to good literature and teaching them how to evaluate that literature. That is an incredibly important skill that we definitely need to continue teaching our students. I think with our education, we have come to this point where there are so many things that we can teach and they're all incredibly valuable, but we don't have time to get to them all. And oftentimes writing workshops, reviewing grammar rules and things like that falls to the wayside in favor of making more time for developing those analytical skills when we're evaluating different pieces of literature. So many students don't have a formal writing course until they have a freshman writing seminar in college. Those classes are typically geared towards familiarizing students with the university's style guide. So they're really teaching the students to write in a way that's tailored for that specific university setting. And granted, that's just for students who decide to go to college. But as we will continue to learn, we need to have our writing skills brushed up before then. You know, we think about the college admissions essays, we think about the essays associated with many AP exams, right? Like learning to write well is such a huge part of the college admissions process. Okay. But writing also has a lot of benefits outside of the school setting. The way that our society has grown, particularly our economy has shifted. Um, being able to write well is a key skill for nearly all jobs these days. You know, you think about having to write emails to your coworkers. You wanna make sure that those emails are legible and that your coworkers understand the calls to action that you've given them. Or if you're writing copy for a marketing campaign, you wanna make sure that that copy is clear. Right? There are so many reasons why we need to be good communicators in today's age. Okay? Um, but more importantly, at least for me, I think, I want students to understand the value of writing because it is a different way for them to use their voice. You know, I work primarily with teenagers in the work that I do here at Apple Ruth, and consistently, Students want to be heard, particularly teenagers. And so helping students craft their skills as writers is a way to give their voice a megaphone, to amplify it, and to help teach them how to get their messages out in the world, to help them understand that how they say a certain thing, they're going to present in this certain way. And so helping them to make sure that they're presenting in the world the way that they want to. Um, so obviously, writing has so many. Um, ramifications both in the academic sphere and outside of it. So it's important for us to learn how to communicate uh, well in, in that sense. Okay. 
So let's get into some of the brass tacks of writing. We're going to start with what do we need to do before we even start the project itself. Um, so this all comes into our brainstorming and our pre-writing portion of the season. First and foremost, we need to know our goal. Writing is very much a journey, but it is a journey with a destination in mind. We need to know where we are going before we start plotting the path there. <laughs> Um, so we need to know the point of whatever we're trying to communicate. And generally speaking, writing can only do one of three things. Um, it can tell a story, it can explain something, or it can offer an opinion. And in each of those three categories, there are definitely more niche um, writing genres that we can look at, um, but they all kind of fall into those big buckets, if you will. So in order to uh, communicate our idea, whatever that idea may be, we need to determine what medium is going to be the best for it. Is it a story? And in, in that case, what kind of a story? Are we making up a story or is it a memoir, right? Or are we explaining something, but are we analyzing something that has already been created or are we providing instructions on how to do something, All right? So we wanna make sure that we're identifying that goal early so we can identify the genre that's going to help us communicate that goal most effectively. Once we have identified our goal and we've identified the style of writing we are going to use, now we get to start with the brainstorming process. What ideas do we want to include? Should we include all of the ideas that come to mind um, based off of the goal of the piece? Okay, pre-writing is a necessity for any good writing. Um, I have met very few people who can, you know, spit out a perfect draft immediately, you know, with no revisions whatsoever. In fact, I don't think I know anybody who can do that without having to go back and at least do a couple of stylistic edits, okay? So when it comes to planning our writing, there are a lot of ways to engage the pre-writing process. Um, I'm going to share some examples here that I find helpful for me and also for my students. This is by no means an exhaustive list and you're absolutely welcome to play around with it and see what works for you. First and foremost, we've got free writing. And free writing is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You think about your goal, you think about the topic that you're writing about, and you kind of do what I call a brain dump. Anything that comes into your brain, you put it on the paper. The goal of this is not for it to be neat or pretty or even coherent. This is just about getting ideas out of your head onto a piece of paper so that you can see all of the ideas, okay? If you end up with a lot of ideas on the paper, that is absolutely fine. The goal is not to incorporate all of these ideas into your finished product, but just to give you some options so you can see what pieces of information go really well together versus what maybe doesn't fit so well, okay? Um, you know, this is a very unstructured kind of pre-writing exercise. Um, so I think it goes without saying, but I will say it anyways. Um, this should not be your final draft. Um, this will be, kind of like loose notes, if you would. So let's say you're listening to this and you say, well, Callie, that may work for some people, but I need structure. <laughs> well, we've got some options for you as well. Uh, the journalist's questions is a fantastic resource um, for getting your project started. So the journalist questions are addressing the questions of who, what, where, when, and how, okay? Um, so who was involved in the story? What was the conflict? Where did it happen? When did it happen? What were the details? How did it all go down? Um, that basically is giving you a list. And for particularly for our younger writers who are just getting started with the process of writing, this is a great tool for them to use in particular. It's also great for older writers who really appreciate that structure. Um, it gives a very clear goal of what pieces we need to identify and include in our piece. The good thing about these questions as well is you can use this for any of the writing styles we mentioned above. If you're creating um, a fictitious short story for your creative writing class, um, this is a great way to figure out like who your main character is, what's their backstory, you know, where's the story taking place. If you're doing something analytical, say a research paper for your history class, then you have to write about a particular conflict. Who was involved in the conflict? What was the conflict over? Where did the conflict happen? and so on and so forth. 
Um, so this is a great one for students who need a little bit more um, structure when doing their brainstorming and pre-writing. Okay. Also related to structure, we've got outlining. I personally love using outlining as a big part of my pre-writing exercises. Um, I essentially treat each Roman numeral as its own paragraph, and then I will create uh, subheadings under each big heading to identify uh, the evidence that I'm going to use to support the claims in, in that particular paragraph. Okay, It's also a fantastic thing visually if you're typing it on a page. You can kind of move different headings around based off of how you feel like the ideas flow together. Um, I know a lot of students who like to use outlining, they'll use it in a very similar way to I just described, then they'll make a copy of that document and then just add sentences throughout. So basically they stretch that outline until it becomes a paper uh, or at least the first draft of their paper. So those are all fantastic resources. So let's say you're listening to all this and you say, I appreciate the structure that you're providing. I appreciate the exercises here, but I'm a visual learner, Callie, and I need something to see. Well, we've got something for you as well. Um, I work with a lot of visual learners as well, and I get it, like being able to see things more spatially is just how some people process information. Um, so I'm going to share three different concept maps that you can use as part of your brainstorming and pre-writing. Um, again, there are so many other resources out there, but these three I find really effective. Um, the first two, especially if you're writing a comparison essay. So first up, we have a t-graph and it's called a t-graph because it kind of looks like a lowercase t. Um, so it's a great brainstorming tool to use when you're writing a comparison essay. Notice that at the top, we've got our two subjects. And then as you go down the list there, um, each item in the list matches one another. So we can kind of break it down into rows and columns. And in the rows, that top row for comparing Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, our top row is what kind of animal are they? The second row is what kind of clothes do they wear? And the last row is what is their personality? Right. So it makes it a lot easier to visualize what those comparison looks those comparisons look like. Pardon me. If you're comparing multiple things in an essay, you can still use a t-graph, you would just kind of extend it. So let's say we wanted to add Goofy to this list. We might go to the right of Donald, extend that line underneath Donald, and add another vertical line, um, and just put Goofy on the other side. Okay, so that's one example we can use. Another example of a visual brainstorming tool we can use is a Venn diagram. This one is also very good for um, brainstorming a comparison essay, because it doesn't just highlight the differences for us, it also highlights the similarities between them. And a good comparison essay highlights similarities between objects, not just the differences. So we can see there that in the um, parts of the circle that overlap is where we see our similarities. And a final visual um, tool for us here is the bubble map. Um, the bubble map is also really fun, particularly um, for students of all ages, I think, depending on how you organize it. You could also color code it, um, depending on how large the essay is. Like if we're talking about modes of transportation as the topic of our essay and automobiles makes up one section of that essay, um, let's say we'd make that section purple and then other modes of transportation, maybe we include, include boats. So we make that section orange or what have you. There are lots of ways you can really amplify the visual nature of this brainstorming tool to make it super effective for your visual, uh, your visual learners. Okay, so we've got the main idea of either that paper or that paragraph, depending on how you're using it in the middle. And then you just kind of branch off from the center to different ideas. And the cool thing about a bubble map is you could even do more branches off of those smaller bubbles. So let's say we look at the car here, we could put a little branch off and have a bubble for sedan, we could have a bubble for a Volkswagen um, and so on and so forth. So you can really make these as comprehensive as you need to depending on the task. Um, and just like with all of our other brainstorming exercises, just because it ends up on the map doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be in the paper. So feel free to add as much as you can. 
um, because it's good to have options. You can always pare something down. Um, It's a lot easier to do that when you've got a robust pre-writing exercise. Um, It's a lot harder to add stuff later once you already have a product that you thought was almost finished and then you realize it's like a page short and now you've got to figure out where you're finding all this extra information from. That's a stressful situation. So the more robust your pre-writing work, the less you deal with that stressful situation. Okay, so we've done our pre-writing. We've got our topics together. We're thinking through how we're going to really communicate this thing that we're writing about. And when we think through the how, it's important to revisit what we talked about at the top of this discussion. Remembering that writing can really only accomplish one of three things. It can tell a story, it can explain something, or it can give an opinion, okay? So we have all of our ideas together with our pre-writing. We want to start thinking about, based on this information I have, what should my reader get by the end of my paper? So if we have done some pre-writing for a story, say, what do we want the reader to learn from this story? Um, Should they learn some kind of lesson? Is there an emotion we want to leave them with? And if I want to leave them with that emotion, how do I need to organize this information to get leave them with that emotion at the end? Right? Same thing with analysis. I have all this information about this history paper. What should the reader learn about this conflict in history by the time they get to the end of my paper? Okay. And if we're doing, of course, an argument, we're presenting an opinion. We want to make sure we've got enough evidence to support our claims so that, you know, we know, hopefully our reader will agree with us towards the end here um, if our goal is to persuade them to our argument. So we've got all of our pre-writing notes. We're thinking through the um, genre that we want to write in. We're also thinking about our reader, constantly thinking about our reader, constantly thinking about what should they get from this by the time they finish reading my piece. So when we get to the part where we're actually taking these ideas and we're crafting them into sentences that you know have a beginning, have an end, we've got a subject, we've got a verb, we've got some punctuation, uh, that can be intimidating for, for some students to take all of these ideas and start putting it into an actual narrative. Um, so when in doubt, a three-pronged thesis is a great way to get started. You know, So here we've got a sample thesis that we're kind of going to pick apart together over the next couple of slides. Um, So the topic for this particular essay is going to be reducing microplastics pollution. So our thesis individually, we can help reduce microplastic pollution by purchasing reusable containers, supporting local agriculture, and making food at home. So when we look at it this way, I've got a couple different colors on the screen now. Um, a three-pronged thesis kind of gives us a clear structure here. So hypothetically, um, if we're going to craft a five-paragraph essay out of this, you know, this would be likely the last sen- sentence of our first paragraph, our introductory paragraph. So we probably start by talking about the issue of microplastic pollution, how it's affecting our oceans, why we should care, and then at the end of that first paragraph, getting into here's what we can do about it. Okay. So it would look something kind of like this, where we have um, one paragraph dedicated to each prong of that three-pronged thesis. Okay, so we give a paragraph to reusable containers, we give a paragraph to local agriculture, and a paragraph to food at home, then wrapping it up in a nice shiny bow. The thing is, when we're doing this writing, we also want to make sure that we utilize clear transitions between ideas. Right? We don't want to just jump from reusable to containers to local agriculture, um, you know, with no warning. Right? And we don't want to give our readers whiplash. Um, so, typically, what I suggest to students is at the beginning of a new paragraph, they add some kind of transition that briefly mentions the previous idea. So. We're working with this example here, example one paragraph, uh, our first body paragraph here, the reusable containers. We might wrap that paragraph up with reusable containers can do a lot to reduce the amount of microplastics that are in our oceans. 
Another way we can reduce microplastics in the oceans is to engage with local agriculture. Right. So I connected both of those paragraphs by specifically mentioning the microplastic pollution in the oceans. Um, and I've let the reader know we're moving on to a different but related idea. Okay. So I like to think of it as it is our responsibility to guide our reader to our destination, to that final thought we want to leave them with. We're like trail guides. Um, and we don't want to lose our reader along the trail. So anything we can do to make those transitions a little bit smoother so that our reader knows when we're shifting ideas, the better it's gonna land. Okay. And paragraph organization is not always an intuitive skill, all right? Um, it's pretty common for students who are just getting in to learning how to write to want to make all of the ideas relate together and when they do that, they usually end up with a page that is just one giant block of text, one giant paragraph. Um, and we want to definitely encourage students away from that. You know, So I like to think of a paragraph as one claim with several pieces of evidence attached to it. Um, so when I'm working with students on how to break up their paragraphs, I'll let them know, hey, it seems like this paragraph is covering a couple of claims. Where can we break that up a little bit? Right, so when it comes to giving them feedback, we definitely want them to be in charge of determining where that break should be. Okay? Because if I just tell them, hey, you need to break this paragraph apart right here, then they haven't internalized that lesson, right? So if we run through a reminder of what are claims, what are evidence, where do we have different claims or two different claims, right? And then I just ask them, you know, where would you get it? You would be surprised at how often they pick really good spots, right? So it is kind of like a trust thing. As we're helping students grow, we got to be able to give them the reins a little bit um, so that they can make those shifts. When it comes to other transitions, um, there are lots of specific transition phrases that we can do um, to help move our readers uh, along our essay. Um, we definitely need transitions in the middle of sentences um, because they allow us to help our readers connect ideas within the context of one sentence or within the confines of one paragraph. Um, they also help us move more effectively between paragraphs as we're trying to help our reader move to the next idea. Okay. So here is a very handy um, screen. I would definitely recommend screen grabbing this cheat sheet here. Um, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> um, but there are a lot of really fantastic words here um, that help us transition between ideas and it also categorizes for us the purpose of that transition word. So let's say, hypothetically, you have a student who is contrasting ideas, um, but they cannot get out of this rut of using the word but to do it, right? One thing that might be helpful is to show them this contrast list and say, hey, here are some other words that serve a similar purpose. Why don't we try incorporating some of these into your essay? You know, um, because while we definitely may need a lot of contrast words, particularly if we're writing a compare and contrast essay, we don't want to fall into the rut of using the same word over and over and over again. That makes us sound a little redundant. It makes our reading a little bit dry, right? And so we want to make sure we're still uh, capturing the attention of our audience and diversifying the words that we use that still accomplish the same task. It still accomplishes the same goal, um, but it helps our readers feel like they're not reading the same thing over and over again. So hopefully this has been enough time to screen grab this page. Um, definitely a fantastic resource. It's also, again, not an exhaustive list. So feel free to look up other words and whatnot. Um, this is a great place to start. There's a lot of good stuff here. Okay. So, We've done our pre-writing, we've crafted our thesis, we've expanded our thesis um, to create our essay. 
we've added transitions to help guide our reader through. We've identified where our paragraphs should be. We've made each paragraph focus on one piece of evidence with several claims to, to support it. Sorry, one claim with several pieces of evidence to support it. My apologies. Um, so we've got our first draft done. Congratulations, you did it. Now we've got to talk about the importance of revision. Okay, so as we discussed earlier, um, typically that first draft is not going to be your last. You know, I wish um, that that wasn't the case, uh, you know, at least like not just for the sake of my students, but for myself personally, outside of Apple Ruth, I do quite a bit of writing <laughs> and I wish I could make it perfect the first time, but that's just not how it works. Um, so revising is an incredibly important thing to do. I think when we talk about revising though, it's really easy to think like, oh, I just need to go through and look at every time I messed something up. Um, and if that's how we frame revision, that's not very enjoyable and not many folks are going to want to do it. <laughs> uh, so we definitely want to reframe what revision looks like and to set some goals for what our revision is going to do, right? Um, so this is a fantastic place to start. So looking at it and saying, do I have a clear, relevant thesis? Okay, if my thesis is not clear, how can I change the language of it to make it a little more clear? So specific details, I have to think of that in terms of our evidence, right? Have I provided sufficient evidence to my claims? Um, have I given my reader the details that they need to see why that claim is solid, right? So effective organization and transitions, this would be a good place to look at that strategy for paragraph revision we talked about a moment ago and saying how many um, claims do I have in this paragraph? If I have more than one, maybe I should break it up and make sure that I have those as two separate body paragraphs with sufficient evidence. In sentence variety, this is a big one. Sentence variety is a big one and learning some grammar rules, refreshing some grammar rules can really help with sentence uh, variety because if all of our essays read like, this is spot, C spot run, C spot, spot chase the ball, our readers aren't gonna wanna read our stuff. <laughs> That's just kind of how it is. So learning, um, some sentence variety, throwing in a couple different clauses, using uh, various kinds of punctuation, uh, all very, very, very important and helpful. Okay, and word precision. Okay, word precision and word economy are very closely related in my mind. And when I'm working with students, we talk about the importance of using um, specific words so we can use as few words as we can to communicate the idea. Because the more surprise, I'm sorry, the more um, precise we can be, the easier it's going to be for a reader to follow our ideas. So there will definitely be times when I'm working with a student, we'll come across a sentence that is like four lines long on their Google Doc, and I'll just put a comment next to it and say, this sentence seems a little clunky. Can we break it up any? Another good way to think about that is how many ideas a sentence is trying to communicate. Um, at max, I think a student, a sentence can communicate two ideas, like maybe two contrasting ideas or like a cause and effect or an if then statement. Anything beyond that, we should probably break it up a little bit more. So that's also a really good rule of thumb for, for most students, I think. Okay. I also think it's important for students to not just learn how to receive feedback, but how to give it themselves. Right. Like we'll talk about this a little bit more later in our time together tonight. Um, but we learn how to become better writers by looking at other writers. And so learning how to give feedback is important because it also teaches students what they need to be on the lookout for in their own writing. So when we highlight to our students that when they give feedback, um, it's good to do so with good intentions and to be constructive and to highlight what um, the person did well and not just the mistakes, that lets the students know that 
they need to do that for themselves when they look at their own work, when they're doing their own revisions and saying, okay, I don't need to just look at what I messed up. I need to look at what I've been improving on. I've been really working hard on that three-pronged thesis. And I, if I'm doing it better, I need to highlight that as well. Um, so I think it definitely goes both ways when we're giving and receiving feedback. And I think it's good, um, you know, particularly if you're a parent sitting down with a student to highlight that to your kid and say, when I'm looking over your essay for you, I want you to know, I'm going to highlight what you did well, as well as what we could polish up a little bit. Okay. Um, I think that that goes a long way with helping students, again, like develop um, how they see themselves and develop that confidence, develop those mastery experiences. Okay. So when it comes to providing feedback, you know, particularly if we're looking over a student's work, I think the temptation would be to look at literally everything, 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 everything. Um, depending on where your student is and how comfortable or confident they feel with the material, that could be a pretty demoralizing process. You know, I can't imagine that, you know, particularly if we're using the stereotypical red pen uh, to mark up the paper that if they come back with a sheet that is just full of red, that they're going to feel particularly motivated to care about doing better with their writing. Um, so I find it helpful to focus on just a couple of mission critical things. And so if I'm working with a student like the student I mentioned earlier, maybe the student has no paragraph breaks whatsoever, and it's just one giant block of text. My higher order skill is going to be focusing on organization in that moment and saying, okay, well, how many ideas do we have in this block? Sounds like we've got five or six ideas in this block. Can, let's see if we can identify where those transitions happen. And let's go ahead and make those paragraph breaks. Right? That's something that will stick with them because again, we're giving them the reins, we're telling them like, hey, this seems to be an edit that we need to look, but I want you to pick where the edit happens. And then maybe we focus on one lower order skill as well. So if you've got a student who is really uh, struggling with subject verb agreement, right? Like maybe on that particular homework exercise, I'm only going to highlight the subject verb agreement errors unless they make a mistake with something that we've addressed in the past, right? So I might bring up something like, hey, we talked about semicolon usage a couple of weeks ago. Um, you did well with that when we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. It looks like maybe we forgot this time, right? So one higher order skill, one lower order skill, unless there's something weird going on with something that you've um, reviewed previously. You know, I think it's also clear um, this approach will take time. It's not going to lead to a magic fix for each essay, but if this is a way of providing feedback that you commit to over time, you will see massive growth, right? Like when you focus on just those couple of things that really allow students to focus on one area, give their attention to that, really polish it up, and then they can shift um, to other concepts while maintaining the progress they made on the first thing we talked about. Okay. So now we get to the practicing. So we finished our essay, we revised it, uh, we've turned that assignment in, um, but we want to practice our writing, maybe a little bit outside of class. And the thing is, uh, you know, nobody just gets magically good at writing overnight. Um, as this comic, I think, so beautifully illustrates, even though it's using drawing as an example here. Um, we've got to practice, just like any other discipline. Um, so we'll talk through a couple of exercises that I find helpful for practicing. Um, and then that'll probably be about it for this evening. Okay. So Definitely want to make sure we take um, time to improve our skill. We can also make practicing writing fun, right? Um, it all comes back down to this growth mindset that has been throughout our essay, not our essay, our time together this evening. Pardon me. Um, so this idea that we can do, we can get better at anything with practice, right? Instead of saying, you know, I am a bad writer or I'm not good at writing. Those kinds of phrases are what we call a fixed mindset, and they operate under the assumption that this is just an unchangeable reality about who I am as a person, um, which isn't the case, right? 
So when I have students who say, oh, I'm just a bad writer, um, I correct that immediately, kindly. And I ask them, you know, well, why do you say that? And I'll highlight, oh, well, it sounds like this is a skill that you haven't had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with. When we look at it as a skill and rather as like this unchangeable character trait, it allows us to approach it from a different angle, okay? So when we make a mistake, if we approach it from a fixed mindset that says, oh, I'm just bad at this, it kind of becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. We say, oh, I'm not a good writer, so I'm not gonna put a lot of effort into it, which means I get a bad grade on it, which confirms my belief that I'm not a good writer. And it just becomes the cyclical kind of spiral of awfulness. That's not fun. But if we look at it from a growth mindset, and say, I made a mistake, what can I learn from this? That actually activates all these different learning paths in our brains. Like it creates new neuron paths in our mind, which is wild. Like the psychology behind this is really cool. Um, but it lets the student feel like they are in control of what has happened and they remember it better. It means they're less likely to make that mistake. Okay, so practicing is important. Um, but as one of my band directors used to say when I was in high school, practice doesn't make it perfect, practice makes permanent. So if we are practicing with that fixed mindset, we're just going to reinforce all those negative self-beliefs, right? Because that's gonna become permanent. If we practice and we focus on implementing that growth mindset, that's where we're really going to see some change. So let's talk about some exercises and the exercises that we can use um, is from what I'm going to affectionately call the three air quote R's, read, write, and revise. I know that middle R is a W, um, but the, the um, sound of the mnemonic works together. Um, so if we want to become a stronger writer, we have to read good writers. You know, if you want to be a good poet, you need to read good poetry. Um, you know, and not just for the sake of reading it for leisure, like absolutely like have your leisure books. Like this bookworm 100% endorses reading books for leisure. There do need to be some books that you read it a little bit more analytically for the purpose of saying, how can I incorporate this cool thing that this author has done into my own writing? We're not plagiarizing, we're looking at stylistic choices, right? Like how does this author communicate this idea? How does this author talk about this conflict in history without it sounding really dry and just like a list of dates? Right. So when we're reading through different pieces for the purpose of enhancing our own writing skills, a list of questions like this can be helpful. Another list of questions that could be helpful are our journalist questions from earlier, seeing if we can identify the who, what, when, where, why, and how of whatever piece we are reading. Um, because first of all, if we can answer those questions easily, that lets us know that this writer knows what they're doing. They can communicate these ideas clearly. And this is a writer that sh we should want to model our stuff after, right? Um, if the author doesn't do those things clearly, that eh, lets us know maybe that's someone, um, we can use them as an, an example of what not to do, <laughs> All right? So being able to read those things, take these um, takeaways from it, can be very um, helpful in terms of seeing what other successful folks have done, okay? So reading can help us become a better writer. Of course, writing helps us become a better writer. We've got some fun exercises that we can do with that. Um, some morning pages. This is something um, for our morning people. Um, generally, the idea with these is that you take 10 or 15 minutes very first thing in the morning before you really do anything while your brain is still kind of mush um, and write stream of conscience. Maybe you try to remember the dream you had last night, um, whatever comes to mind. Um, and the goal there is just to kind of like do a pre-day stretch, right? Like it might be the equivalent of your morning workout before like going to practice later that day, right? So it's just about getting those ideas out on paper. And you may not use them for anything, but some of them might be the genesis of a cool story. You never know. Um, so that's one exercise that can be helpful. Another exercise that you can do is what I like to call throw back to Twitter. And when I say throw back to Twitter, I mean like the OG Twitter um, where you were limited to 180 characters. Um, I had a grad school professor give us this as an assignment one time for a book that we were reading. And you know the stuff was really dense, really heady. The chapters were long. 
and he only gave us 180 characters to summarize each chapter. That was one of the most challenging assignments <laughs> um, I ever did in grad school, but I am incredibly thankful to my professor for that because it really taught me the value of how to communicate complex ideas concisely, right? So students might scoff at this at first and then they'll get into it and realize, ooh, this is a little harder than I expected. Um, so I definitely think it is a fun challenge and you can also gamify this, right? You can definitely make it like if you're reading Romeo and Juliet, like what would Juliet's Twitter feed look like? What, what would she be tweeting right now? Like you can definitely make it more fun, um, but it's also a really fantastic way to help students be more concise. Okay. Um, other things to do, just random prompts. So like maybe from pictures or there are definitely lots of books out there that provide lots of prompts to writers. So like you pull up a random image on Google Images and write a story based off that. So like with this picture, we might say, why is everybody looking at me? Am I a kid in this scenario? Have I done something really embarrassing? All of the clothes and the toys seem really dated. Have I traveled back in time? Did I intend to travel back in time? Right, so like there are lots of questions we can ask ourselves based off this image that would allow us to write something pretty quickly. Um, and just for fun, again, because this is practice, right? Um, if we want something a little bit less on the creative uh, writing side, but more on like the narrative side, we could look at, you know, an explanation kind of thing. Um, what's an experience that you've had that you would like to do again, or a famous person from history that you would like to meet? And we can make it even more analytical than that. So in terms of like learning how to do persuasive writing, we could look at agree or disagree statements. And so write an argument on why you agree or disagree with that statement. So we've got a couple of statements on the screen that you could absolutely use. So action speaks louder than words. Do we agree or disagree? Too many cooks spoiled broth. All good things come to those who wait. Okay. So with our younger writers, it is, I think, 100% appropriate to keep it on this binary of yes, no, agree, disagree. Once we get to our older writer, those particularly our high school students, like if I'm working with students who are preparing for the AP English language exam, for example, I'm going to encourage them to move beyond that binary and focus a little bit more on nuance, right? So that last example, all good things come to those who wait. Do you agree or disagree? My response to that prompt would highlight the fact that the context of the waiting matters, you know? If I'm baking a cake, it's good to wait until it's finished baking and the reward is a very sweet reward. Um, but if it's during a race at my track meet for school, I can't afford to wait. I need to go when the ref says go. So all good things come to those who wait definitely matters on the situation, okay? And so crafting an argument like that requires a bit more nuance. It's um, if we're thinking specifically on how the AP language exam um, rewards students and gives them points, that's definitely a point in sophistication, right? And an awareness of the rhetorical situation. Um, it's also not a wishy-washy argument. Context matters is a claim that I can support with a lot of evidence, right? So encouraging students to move beyond that binary, I think only helps develop their analytical skills as people. Um, and it's definitely something we want to set them up for if they choose to go to college, okay? Another thing that we can do um, with practicing writing is how to, ex or explaining how to do something, right? I think when the pandemic hit in the peak of 2020 and all of the businesses started putting up instructions for how to wash your hands, I think most of us were surprised to see just how many steps there were um, to washing our hands well. This is also a really easy activity to gamify for multiple students. Um, I did this activity with a group of students last month at a writer's workshop where I broke them up into groups and I asked them to write instructions for how to draw a dog. Um, that was the only instruction I gave them. And then after they finished writing their instructions, I paired them up. One student was to read their instructions and the other student was to follow those instructions as literally as possible. So if the student reading their instructions didn't specify how big the oval was supposed to be when they drew the body of the dog, the student who was drawing was free to make that 
oval as large or as little as possible. If the student reading the instructions didn't indicate that the legs needed to be attached to the body, well, you can see where this is going. <laughs> um, another really easy way to gamify this is um, to have students write instructions for how to make a PB&J sandwich and then to blindfold the other kids and have the kids listening to the instructions follow the instructions as literally as possible why they can't see anything. Um, this is a fantastic way to get real-time feedback about how specific your instructions are, and it's a way to make it fun. So, and even with our practice, we want to make sure that we focus on revision. Okay, so this is again something that you can do with a friend, something you can do with a parent, something that you can do yourself by looking at whatever you wrote a couple days later. Even with our practice, we want to see like what things we've been improving on and what things we can still polish. Okay. But at the end of the day, when all else fails, just keep writing. You know, writing is a skill that I don't think anyone can ever completely master. Um, it's like a good vocalist, you know, someone who is going to sing their entire lives. And as they continue to practice, their voice is only going to get richer, more mature, um, capable of expressing more and more. And writing is a very similar thing. Um, the more you practice, the richer your writing gets. And you can always, always become a richer, um, more thoughtful writer um, as you practice. So that's that's my spiel. Um, so we are about to shift to a time of Q&A, but before that, we do have a poll that we would ask for you to fill out. We definitely wanna make sure that we get some information about who all is tuning in from where, um, so we can make sure that this information is or the information that we give everyone is as accurate as possible, as relevant um, to our students as possible. So if you would do that poll, you'd definitely be doing us a solid. And I thank you in advance for doing that. Um, while you're doing that and potentially getting your questions queued up, I do want to highlight a couple of things for you. Um, we do have a couple of services that would hopefully be helpful for you all. Um, I think it goes without saying, we have a writing workshop. <laughs> we actually have a curriculum that highlights a lot of what we talked about tonight and so much more. It's also tailored to students between uh, grades five and 12, and it's set up for a one-to-one -one experience. Um, like I've worked through the curriculum with several students already, and I find it to be really fun and accessible for students and really adaptable for all age levels. Um, so that's definitely something that I want to encourage you to check out if this uh, webinar tonight piqued your interest. Um, for those of you who are saying maybe I'm going to take the summer off for my writing, we do have our biggest uh, summer sale going on right now as it relates to all of our test prep tutoring. Um, it's a really great deal for every 10 hours you purchase, you can get to two hours free. Um, and we do, as you can see on the screen there, so many kinds of test prep um, and you know school is just around the corner uh, college admissions is just around the corner for our rising seniors so if you want to take that test one last time like this deal is definitely an awesome thing to take advantage of and last but not least I do want to shout out our executive function coaching uh, that I mentioned at the top of our hour tonight um, this is again getting assistance with that invisible syllabus for school um, and helping your student um, build the tools they need for success to have the, that organization um, to really help them map out what success looks like for them for their school year. So with that in mind, we'll now open up the Q&A. Um, so I'll take a look. Um, here it looks like we do have a question in the chat asking, will we be sending um, everyone the full recording? And I believe the answer to that question is yes. Um, and I'll let my colleague who is running uh, tech in the background uh, confirm that, um, but I'm pretty sure the answer to that question is yes. All right, and for those listening in, yes, the answer to that question is you will receive the full recording later this week. Okay. 
So we do have a little bit of time left. And if anyone has some questions that they would like to ask, I would love to encourage you to put those in the chat now. Um, I'd be happy to address them while we've got some time left. And I'll give it another minute or so just to give folks some time. Um, and while we're waiting, in case anybody wants to put some time out there, um, I do just want to again highlight uh, the writing curriculum that we have. We cover so much, um, so many things that we covered tonight in much more detail in that curriculum. And it's really a, dare I say, fun, accessible resource for your student. Uh, looks like we've got. Um, another question in the chat, um, would the ACT or the SAT be better to take? That is a fantastic question that I think is a little bit outside the scope of our content this evening. Um, I will say that Apple Ruth provides um, practice tests for each. So what I would suggest um, that you do is that you take one of each of those practice tests because it's not like one test is better than the other. I think some students' brains are maybe better tailored for how one test prevents, uh, presents the information over the other. So I would encourage you to call in, connect with one of our program directors. They can help you set up um, a time to take those practice tests. Um, they don't count for anything real, right? And the data would just stay between you and your parents. And if you work with a tutor, they would have access to it too. Um, but it give you a pretty concrete idea of where your natural strengths lie. Um, so that's that's what I would recommend. All righty, well, I think that is it for us this evening. If you have any questions about anything from tonight, because if you're anything like me, you need to mull on it for a little while, and then the questions will come in about an hour, please feel free to email into info at appleruth.com. Um, we can definitely get you connected with some folks to address those questions, or even a program director to talk through our writing curriculum and the possibility of getting that for your student. Um, thank you all so much for hanging out with us this evening. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for indulging me and in talking about one of the things I love the most in the world. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic week wherever you are.